Hello, in this video we are going to look at some of the basic rules of building a database using the concepts of normalization, concept of normalization. Now, um, we'll look at how tables revolve around being uh, storing data about subjects and events, what primary keys can do for you, uh, why you should have them, um, what multi-part columns might look like or multi-value columns might look like and why you should avoid them. We'll also talk about composite uh, primary keys designs. These uh, rules of normalization are something that you learn about all the time when you're talking about database design. Uh, and we'll break it down to some, just some basic common sense kind of ways of looking at it. So let's get started. I'm going to go through this video using um, a file with a whole bunch of script in it that this is what I usually use when I'm going through a class and just kind of talked about the the concepts of writing some code now I have some some basic data here that shows apples were purchased at a particular price a number, certain number of apples were purchased by a particular customer at a particular address uh, on a particular date. And we don't know much about it, but this is something that a spreadsheet might include. Now, people have been storing data in spreadsheets for a long time, or just lists, or pieces of paper, or whatever the heck, in this format. But over the years, when you start getting a lot of data, and you try to work with it, and by maintaining it or updating it, let's say, uh, let's say Bob changes his name to Robert. Now he wants to be called Robert. I may have to go back and update that, and in this case, three places. And that just gives me three chances to make a mistake. I can already see one right here, where I've got a, a one and no comma. So it's really easy to make errors that um, when you maintain the data over time and make modifications to it, or even when you insert the data, uh, another row of data in here. and somebody thought let's come up with a better plan for organizing and storing data and that person came up with a, the term normalization now this was a, a man named EF Codd 1973 I think it was he had this this talk about how um, you could use the rules of normalization to design uh, databases more efficiently and the rules included a number of different uh, individual rules, but um, here is the basic three that people talk about on a regular basis, and that is every column in the table must be atomic. They should have a single value per entry in that table. And the first rule needs to be recognized, and then on top of that, Every column, sometimes they're called fields or attributes even, every column must be dependent on a set of candidate keys. Now, a candidate key is one that you choose that could identify one row from the next. It's a candidate until you vote for it and choose to make it the primary key. At that point, the primary key, the third rule is that all fields in the, the table must be dependent on the primary key, the chosen primary key. Now, it's academic jargon, and it, it makes sense if you delve into it long enough, but in practical, for practical purposes, you don't need to actually read EF Codd's um, speech on this. You don't need to, to go through all the, the mathematical formula. You don't have to worry about um, relational algebra or anything like that to basically understand the standard rules. Let's uh, let's just look at that. So first thing I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and make a new database called NormalDB and I'll focus on it. Now I'm in SQL Server and that means I can actually work with many different databases. So once I make a new database I got a whole bunch of them already here including an AA database, a AAA database I made earlier. But I want to use the new one I just made, so I focus on it and execute that code. Now, that means that the service is now connecting this connection. This connection is represented by this tab. If I click on the new query button, I get another tab. That's a different connection altogether. 
each connection actually has a connection ID. Come on. Oops. The connection ID is down here at the bottom. If you look here, you can see this is connection 58. Back where I was, it was connection 57. So I've got uh, these different connections. And this connection, connection 57, is currently focused on the normal DB file. Okay, so I have a database, but there's no tables in it yet. So I'm going to just to work with that. I'm going to make a new table. Now, every table that you make should be either about a subject or event. And if you look at the tables in a database, you'll notice that they're about some kind of subject matter, some object, such as a person, uh, a customer, a product, um, a supplier, a, um, I don't know, some kind of subject. Or it's about some event. Some inventory was counted, a web a visit happened, uh, a sale occurred. Those are all events. I'm going to um, make a table that I see people do that combines products and customers. Now, you might do this because you think, hey, that, I, this is going to be great. I got customer name, I got their phone number, I got the product that they bought, and maybe the price they bought it for. And you're thinking this is going to be awesome, uh, but it really isn't a great choice. Because what you've done is you've made a table about multiple subjects, in this case, two subjects. One subject is stuff about customers, and one is stuff about products. And it really should have been two different tables. Now, what makes it keep occurring out there in the real world is that it works. I mean, you look at it, and I can see, yeah, Bob Smith bought a Chia Pet for $9.99. And, hey, this must be Bob's phone number. So... It's not like I'm not storing the data and not being able to glean some information out of it. It's just not, it's not a best practice. A better practice that's proven to be very effective over the years is to break it up. I have a customer's table with customer name and phone number. I have a product's table with a product name and product price. These two tables combine hold my data. I just insert into the customer's table the phone number and the name. And I insert into the products table the name of the product and the price. I store the same data. Did I run that? Let's go find out. I'm not sure it ran. Nope, still empty. Let me run those insert statements. I'm hitting the execute button up here. And I've actually changed my user interface so it has a hide and show button. I did that by going to customize commands, toolbar, choosing the SQL editing toolbar, and adding on that show results pane. I'll do this quickly because you guys can pause it in the video and look at it. But I choose Windows on the left, show results on the right. I say OK, that added in, I put it in there. So that's why you see me clicking on this. If you'd just like to show and hide the results in SQL, you can just do Control R and it will toggle back between showing and hiding. <clears throat> Sorry to make you uh, to stop and tell you about that, but some people by now are probably wondering, well, where the heck is he doing there? So we've got two tables. It doesn't, um, it's not very difficult to extract the information out of these tables. I can still figure out that Bob Smith has this phone number. What I don't see is how the product and the customer are connected. We really should have had some additional table for that. But uh, we'll get to it a little bit later. It would be possible for me to combine the, the, the two, but I need to have some kind of way of linking it. And again, we'll get to it in a bit. Now, I do have two tables, but they're not well designed yet. What I need to do is I need to have a way to identify one row from the next. Currently, there's only one row of data in there, so it's pretty easy to figure out that this customer, Bob Smith, is, well, the only Bob Smith I have. But later on, if I have another Bob Smith, then that would not be unique. I'd have to have some way of identifying which Bob Smith I'm talking about when I'm discussing the data. The little one you see on the side is cosmetic. 
it's actually not a one in the data table. Let me uh, change this over to show the results as text. I'll do so by clicking on this button. Now, let me zoom in for you. Um, now when I run that same code, you can see that the, the one was indeed cosmetic. It's no longer there. It was just a, an artifact of this grid mode, which I usually keep things in. So I don't have an actual identifier to indicate the difference between one Bob Smith and another. So if I had another Bob Smith, that would be an issue. Let's say I have a third Bob Smith, but they have a different phone number. If we had a, a, an actual number, one, two, three, we could tell one from the other. We could try to use the phone number, but it's not unique. So I can't tell the difference if are these the same entry or they're just Bob Smith Senior and Junior. It's not a good idea not to have some kind of artificial column. So I'm going to go ahead and drop both those tables. I'll make an artificial column called Customer ID and Product ID. And that has been proven to be a real much, much better design. So I go through. I put those in. I'll make an integer value, and I will indicate that I want to use this column to identify one row from the next by flagging it as being the primary key. So you should, every time you make a table, add an artificial column. Usually we call it ID. It doesn't have to be called that, but most people do. And indicate that it's the column we're using to identify one row from another by putting the primary key uh, keywords there to, inf uh, to flag it as being the chosen column. And I would do that with both these tables. So drop the tables. Oops, looks like it. And now I insert the data back in. And I just put in this artificial number. I just make up a number. I'll start with one for Bob Smith and 100 for products, but I just made up a number. You can make up any number you want. So every table you make should be about a single subject, and every uh, table should have a artificial primary key column. That's proven to be a real good choice. It's really easy to do. So make your tables like that. Another thing you want to avoid is uh, having a situation where you have multiple part columns or fields. Let me, uh, get rid of that table again. I'm going to add on a customer's address column to my table. And I'm going to insert the address. 123 Main Street, Bellevue, Washington, and some zip code. And let's look. Let's see if it works. Awesome. It worked just fine. I got the data. Lovely. But the problem is, is that this actual bit of data could have been divided up into multiple sections. Right now, each of these sections is a different part. It's a multi-part field. Now, it will work, but if I ever want to zoom in and, and like group my data based on all the customers in Washington, or all the customers in Bellevue, or even all the customers in a given zip code, oh, I can do it. But I have to actually read through that string of characters isolate the piece I want, probably by looking at the commas, worrying about any spaces that might be there, and extracting out a string of characters to match it on. That is not proven to be a good choice. So while this works, if you can, break apart a multi-part field like this into its own little columns. So I'll get rid of the table again, and I'll come back over here, and I'll have four columns where I used to have just one, one for the address, one for the city, one for the state, one for the zip. If we want it, we could have one for country. If we want it, we could have a second address line. A lot of people do, so they can have like apartment numbers and the like. But in our case, this is just a better design. And how difficult is it? It's not. You just have to recognize that that's an issue. 
So the rule is that if you think you'll ever group the data by something, think about um, splitting it up into its own column. You'll also notice that I split up the first name and last name. So I split up the first name and last name into its own column as a column as well, so that once again I can search by all the people with the last name of Smith or all the people with the first name of Bob. Go either way. So easy, easy rule. Just break up any fields that look like they could be um, data that we could group by. Something similar is a multi-value field and that it's got a string of text with commas. But um, <clears throat> it actually represents some data that's in correlation with something else. And <clears throat> let me uh, just show you an example again. So I've got a, a sales table here that's going to finally link our customers and products table. That's awesome. But the way it's going to do it's not all that great. It's a bad sales design. But I'll show you what it looks like that way when you see one in the wild. You'll know what to rec uh, what you recognize it. So I put the values in here as product 100, 101, 102. That's on the product column. And 2, 5, and 3. Now I can assume that that means that, well, that means that I bought product 2, or excuse me, I bought product 100 at a quantity of 2. I bought product 101 at a quantity of 5, and 102 at a quantity of 3. So I can look over this data and kind of figure that out. But it really isn't a great design. You can see here that humans can figure it out. Uh, the computer has to be told exactly how to approach this. Once again, the best choice would be to break this up into pieces. That's exactly what we do. We just get rid of that bad design. And we break it up so that we have a sales table. And we have another table that specifically revolves around the individual sales items. So it's like when you go to I don't know, get a cup of coffee and a bagel, you'll have one receipt. That would be your sale. And it might even be one customer if they have a customer ID for you. But you'll have one row in the sales line items on the receipt for your coffee and another item uh, row for your the bagel that you bought. That's all we're doing here. We just split it up from one bad sales design table into two tables. One where it's all about the individual sale. And if in this thing, uh, in this design, I basically said that one sale can have one customer. But one sale can have many individual line items. And each line item has one product. And each product on that line item has one quantity. And I'll enforce that restriction here by combining these two columns, saying that it's a combination of that sales item, sales ID, and the line item that make the uniqueness. I guess I already ran that. So first of all, I insert the individual sale. I just made up a number, 1001. And let's see. This must be the customer ID, so that means Bob Smith again. And here's our sales items. When I look over the data, I can see now that Bob Smith has bought something on sales 1001. And then the various different products Looks like I only got one product in there. But the various different products uh, had the various quantities. And so now we each column has a single value in it. It's not a combination of values. Again, a much better design. Over, over the years, it's proven to be a, a great choice. So you want to try to do that every time. You'll notice that um, one of the things that happen is that we... Uh, we have a situation where we have a single column acting as our primary key to identify one row from another. But in the sales line item, we actually have a composite a collection of columns that uniquely determine one row from another. When we look at this, we see exactly what's happening. Oops, let me zoom in again. It's the combination of these two columns that uniquely identify 
which sales line item we're on, which sale item we're dealing with. So this is a composite primary key and one of the classic designs that you'll end up using. Now, when you have a composite primary key, the second rule was all about all the columns must be dependent on the combination of both of those columns. So if I were to try to put the sales date in there, then what would occur is that the sales date would show up three times in our example. So I had a sales date column in here. The sales date would be one, two, three, one for each row because it was the same sale, which means that the sales date would only be a, <clears throat> only be about, come on, the sales ID, not about the combination of the sales line item, meaning that it violates that second normal form where <clears throat> the every column should be about the the whole combination of the primary key. Somebody thought it was cute to say the key, the whole key, and nothing but the key. And this is the whole key. So product ID is indeed about the combination of that sale and that line item. But the sales date would only be about the sales ID. And as such, it shouldn't go there. It should go as another column up here in the sales table. So if I want to put it anywhere, I drop the sales table and I add it to the sales table. That's the place that would go. Whenever you're designing a, a table, always look for those situations where <clears throat> a column isn't about the primary key. And if you have a composite primary key, it's got to be about the whole primary key, not just part of it. Now our database tables are looking a little bit better. Awesome. You will be surprised how often when you start looking at existing databases how something has crept into the system uh, that violates this, this rule. For example, a bad sales design might include a customer's phone number or even their name. The thought process was probably that if I put it here, I don't have to look in two different tables to get my data. But the problem is, is that customer name and customer phone is really only about the customer ID. That's what determines which customer we're talking about, and it violates that third normal form. Normal, normal form. So, once again, it works. And that's why you still see it out there in real life, even though this rule's been around since the 70s. But it's a bad idea. Don't do that. Don't put in the customer phone number or the customer name, just put in the customer ID. Let's get rid of that bad table. Now, if you have some time, take a look at Microsoft's pubs database and examine a couple of different tables, discounts, authors, and sales. And uh, it usually takes about 10 minutes. Take a look at that and see what kind of issues you spot. I think you'll be, uh, quite surprised. So pause the video for a few minutes, uh, give yourself like 10 minutes, and then take a look. And th then come back to the video and we'll talk about it. Okay, so by now you've probably got that done. So I'm going to take a look at the pubs database here. There's a pubs database. And um, let me make a new query window. We'll just do some selection. So select all from, I think it was discounts. There we go. And we look here at it, and what column could be used to, to identify one row from another? Well, we got discount type, that's unique. Uh, right now, I've got initial customer, value customer, and customer discount. There's no duplication there. But to tell you the truth, these aren't really an artificial value. They're actually some kind of information that we're trying to store. Remember that these ones, twos, and threes on the side here are just cosmetic. So the actual design of that table did not include 
an actual artificial primary key column. Let's see here. It's not one that uh, made sense. They just didn't do that. They should have actually added in a column um, for called, I don't know, discount ID. That's all it would have taken. It's a very simple mistake, but it was a mistake nonetheless. Another thing that we're seeing here is um, I see a lot of null values. Whenever I see a lot of null values, I got to start wondering, you know, what's what's going on with that? Um, in this case, looks like an initial customer has some kind of discount. There's no real clear indication what type what the discount is. Is that a percentage? Is it ten dollars and fifty cents? What is it? We don't know. Making names uh, more descriptive is a real important thing to do in any database design. So I would make this more descriptive. Along those same lines, look at the, the name of the columns here. This one has star ID. We gave up an, an E for an underscore. How is that actually better? I really don't know. And if you have store underscore ID, why don't you have high underscore quantity or low underscore quantity? Like I said, nulls are kind of an interesting thing that kind of pop out, which means that we have a situation where um, regardless of the store, there is um, there, there may not be initial customers regardless of the store. But in another case here, customer discount, that, um, that one applies only to a given store. Notice that um, we never see another situation where customer discount is used, but it certainly could be on a different store, which would mean that if you did, that would be a this would no longer be uh, unique, but by then we'd have our own primary key column, so that would be all right. Um, there's a lot more we could probably extract from there, but let's move on to the next one. We're looking for things that just kind of pop out at you. Select all from authors. Okay. Once again, once again, we see things like um, the naming convention: AU underscore ID, AU underscore last name, underscore first name. They didn't spell out the word last name. Okay, well, that may be fine. But then you get the phone number, and apparently they got tired at that point because they didn't put in AU underscore. Um, that's kind of weird. If you're going to start off one way, you probably should continue. Being consistent in your naming convention really makes a difference, and you want to try to do that whenever possible. So this is not consistent, and take a look at their author ID they used. That suspiciously looks like a social security number, which is a no-no. Now this is um, this is something you don't want to do in real life, but back in the uh, 80s when this uh, database was designed, people did it. And today, there are still databases out there that use a particular person's uh, social security number as an identifier. Real bad move, but I still see it today in real life. Crazy, huh? So never do that. Always use an artificial ID. The problem is, is that this is never an artificial ID, and you should always stay away, stay away from that. The um, phone number could be identified as being a multi-value field with the area code needing to be split up into a different column. And when I first started teaching um, database design, we would do that. But that's back before cell phones made the area code kind of immaterial. We used to do it because when you sort or group customers by the area code, you kind of knew their location. And that could be used for we're doing all kinds of things. But now the area code is meaningless as far as grouping people into any geographic location. And so just having it as a single column is perfectly fine. This just goes to show you that over time, your database design may need to change. You always want to plan for that. Okay, what was the last one here? Oh, it was the sales table. Okay, 
the sales table. I see that crazy uh, store underscore ID. Again, we only saved a uh, we only saved an E. I'm not sure of the, the numbering system here. Uh, if you look at it, it seems like those numbers are kind of random. Um, you would think they'd be like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Whenever I see something like this, I'm suspicious that it's tied into some kind of data in the real world. I don't know what that data could be, but it makes me nervous because if something in the real world changes, then my numbering system's kind of messed up. Again, you never want to have a identifier, primary key identifier, that has some kind of real value in, in the real world. I see the same thing happening here with order number. These look suspiciously like something that's being generated by some kind of vendor because they have a different pattern for each. You want to try to, to use a primary key that, um, or some kind of value that would uh, be in your control, not in the control of somebody else. Now this is the sales table. So what sounds like it would be the appropriate identifier? Well, we need something that's unique. And store ID is not unique. How about order number? That sounds promising, but it's not unique either. Hmm. How about dates? Nope, I see some duplicates there. Quantity makes no sense. Payment terms? No. And title ID? Not going to happen, and I'm sure I find that it's not unique either. Yeah, right here at the top. So there's no column here that actually uniquely identifies one row from another. It's missing that. And as such, it should have had some kind of sales ID column. They never put it in there. So that's uh, the first mistake. The, um, the second thing we probably should do is um, think about what columns would go, if we're going to have a sales table, we're going to have a line items table as well. Which columns goes with sales and which columns goes goes with the uh, line items. So let's see. Sales and sales line items. Well, the date, you can see that if somebody bought something on a particular sale, it may be different products, or in this case books, they're selling titles books, <clears throat> but they're on the same date, they're even on the same order number, they're at the same store, so this means that we got a bunch of redundant data here, and that just kind of goes to show you that store ID, store ID should be in the sales table, order number should be in the sales table, and order date should be in the sales table as well. If we did that, then we'd have one sale ID for that one store, that one order, and that one date. Payment terms looks like it's always going to be the same. We'd have to check out a little further to be sure, but I'm pretty sure that's what we're going to see. So that means payment terms is going to go up here too. That just means that title ID and quantity are going to show up in the sales line item, and then we just need something to to link sales to sales line items, so we'll have a sales ID in there, and then a line item ID like we just saw earlier. Had they designed it correctly, the table would have looked something like that. If we start looking at things like data types, we see some crazy stuff there too. So some of the choices are kind of odd. Discount type, variable character 40. We'll talk about data types at a later point in time. But notice that even things like the first name and last name. Apparently, first names, they assume, are going to be longer than last names by twice as much. Or should I say, last name is going to be longer than first name by twice as much. It's an interesting concept. I'm not sure why they thought that. But it should be consistent, and it's not. Try to make your data types consistent, and I'll talk more about that in a later video. So anyway, the rules of normalization are pretty straightforward from a practical sense. They're a little hard to read when you go out and read it. I'm going to ask or recommend that you go out and do some searching around, look at Wikipedia, look at what they have to say about it. But at the end of the day, it just comes down to some basic standard things of A, always having one a table be about one 
subject or event B. Make sure that every table has a primary key. C. Making sure that uh, if you have a multi-part field, break it up. D. Making sure that if you have a multi-value field, break it up. And uh, I guess we're up to E now. Making sure that every column in the table is about the key, the whole key, and nothing but the key. If you follow those basic design um, strategies, you'll end up making good, solid table design choices for your, your database.